God's Word brings people to faith, it enables people to grow in faith, and it encourages people in turn to share their faith. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord will stand forever. Christianity is about the wonder of what Christ has done. He loved you before the dawn of time. The answer to our broken world is found only one place, at the cross of Jesus Christ. Luke 4, 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town, and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. Thanks be to God for his word. It's a telling thought, isn't it, that uh, people are prepared to tolerate Jesus just to the point where he contravenes their expectations. And then it's a very different response. Well, Father, as we turn to the Bible, we pray for your help, clarity, brevity, humility. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you can see from the printout this morning, our simple uh, bulletin, we've set ourselves the task in this Bible talk to address the question, why did Christ come? That is, of course, a straightforward question that has the potential for a very long answer. I don't plan to have a very long answer. I have uh, three points that I'm going to make. But before we come directly to that specific question, let's just acknowledge the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ did come. Uh, every so often, you'll bump into someone in the street who says, well, I don't think that Jesus ever came, which is, of course, a very difficult thing to substantiate, not simply on account of the fact that the Bible is so very clear, but also on account of the fact that secular history, both Roman and Jewish history, affirms the fact of the personhood of Jesus of Nazareth, and even more so that after his death, his followers continued to worship him as God, to gather together on the first day of the week. And in fact, throughout history from that time, our calendar, the Gregorian calendar, has been marked by the coming of the Lord Jesus. That is why we have B.C. and A.D., even if you change it from before Christ, as many do, because they don't want to acknowledge Jesus, and change it to before the common era, 
One still has to say, well, what was it gave the common era its time point? And the answer is, of course, the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. So before we answer the question, why did he come? There is another question, and that is, from where did he come? Where did he come from? Now, the answer that comes in the Bible, and I'm not going to work my way through it, I'm just setting you in that direction, and you can follow up on your own. When the crowd asked Jesus uh, concerning uh, the manna that had been provided in the wilderness, uh, Jesus, in responding to them, uh, struck a very interesting chord. He said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it wasn't Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Here we go again. For I have come down from heaven. I have come down from heaven. And as you read your way through the New Testament, this comes again and again. That's why we often sing about these things. In the Graham Kendrick song, From Heaven You Came, Helpless Babe, Entered Our World, Your Glory Veiled. That's what we're saying. Uh, the Gettys gave us the words, You're the Word of God the Father from before the world began. Every star and every planet has been fashioned by His hand. All creation holds together by the power of his voice. Let the skies declare your glory. Let the land and sea rejoice. So in other words, we're not going to be able to get away with it by simply trying to dismiss the story of Jesus and the incarnation as being some kind of trivial little event that holds interest for children but for no one else. In actual fact, uh, the story of Christianity stretches us beyond comprehension. Now, children ask the toughest questions at the strangest times. I remember driving to Florida during the middle of the night. I was the only one awake. I thought I was the only one awake in the minivan. And out of the darkness came a small voice there had been no conversation prior to this along these lines, of which I was aware. And the voice said, Daddy? I said, Yes. She said, Where was I before I was born? Okay, this is 3 o'clock in the morning, somewhere in the middle of, uh, of wherever, Georgia, whatever. Well, I said, You didn't exist before you were born. You were nowhere before you were born. Of course, a Hindu father would not have answered in that way. A Hindu father, if he was a Zoroastrian, would have said, every soul is allotted 108 existences to achieve its intimate self-realization. Well, clearly, these are very, very different perspectives on the world, aren't they? The people who say, well, it's all the same. We're all the same. We're on the main things. We're all the same. No, we're not. On the main things, we're absolutely, completely, diametrically opposed to one another. We say that the Incarnation was a unique and unrepeatable event. Hindus say that Incarnation and Reincarnation has taken place and is taking place hundreds and thousands of times. We can both be right. No, the claim from Scripture, and John makes this clear in his prologue, is that Jesus is eternal and he's preexistent. He introduces him to the reader as a one-of-a-kind son of the Father who is himself God, who has revealed and who has explained in himself Godhead to humanity, as much as humanity can grasp that in his personhood. Well, you say, let's get back to the question. Why did Jesus come? Well, let me just, let me just pause for one more time. Let's be clear about why he did not come. Because on a number of occasions, Jesus explained, I didn't come for this reason. And you, if you know your Bible, will know these. Number one, he says, I did not come to call the righteous. I didn't come to call the righteous. That, of course, was very offensive to the religious people who assumed that he would definitely be hanging with them. 
In fact, he had many of his most stinging rebukes for the religious hypocrisy that was represented in the heart of that movement. I didn't come to call the righteous, he said, nor did I come to condemn or to judge the world. That's what people will often say. Oh, he's only come. He's a condemnatory word from Jesus. No, it's not. He said, I didn't come to condemn or to judge the world. I came to save the world. Thirdly, he says, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. In other words, don't look to me to set aside the Old Testament. The Old Testament is pointing forward always to me, to myself. What an amazing claim for somebody to make. And fourthly and finally, I didn't come to be served. I didn't come to be waited upon. All right? Well, then why did he come? Why did Jesus come? Three answers. He came because he was sent. He came because we're stuck. And he came because he saves. All right? Sent, stuck, saved. First of all, then, he came because he was sent. In other words, he was a man on a mission. When he explains to his disciples, they don't get it in John chapter 4, when they come back, having uh, gone into the town to get some lunch, they have left Jesus by the well. He's got involved in a conversation with the uh, uh, lady who has come to draw water. Uh, they come back, and they find that uh, everything has gone uh, kind of funny on them. And uh, uh, he, he explains to them that he has food to eat about which they know absolutely nothing. And they look at one another and say, well, who went out and got him a sandwich? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. In other words, Jesus is a sent one. John chapter 7, I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true. So Jesus stands on the stage of time, and he says, I am here, I've come from God, and I've come not on my own accord, but I've come dispatched by the Father. Now, when you think about this, it is an amazing statement, isn't it? That here is a man on the stage of time, and he announces to his followers and to all who will listen to him that unlike you and me, who did not exist before we were born, there was never a time when he was not. There was never a time when he was not. Christ in Scripture is never introduced to us as anything other than he who, along with the Father and with the Spirit, is eternal and self-existent. In the beginning, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make man in our own image. So it is a radical statement. And it is a statement to which men and women will only come through the eyes of faith. Theologians wrestled with it, trying to make sense of it, trying to explain it in a way that people could grasp. And thinking in terms of commitments and covenants, they spoke of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in eternity, determining essentially, if we can put it in common parlance, who would do what. And so, traditionally, we've spoken of that which was planned by God the Father, that which was procured or achieved or accomplished through God the Son, and that which then is applied to the life of an individual through God the Holy Spirit. Now, the point is pretty obvious, but we shouldn't miss it. God is not making things up as he goes along. This is not some kind of ad hoc journey. God, from all of eternity, has purposed in this way to send his Son. It's the old Gaither song, isn't it? God sent his Son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. I can't remember it beyond that. It just came to mind just now. But Jesus is sent into the world by the Father. And he tells his followers that the very words that he speaks are not his own words, but are the words that the Father gave him to speak. Listen, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. How remarkable is this? Why is Jesus come? Because he was sent. He was dispatched willingly, purposefully, savingly. Secondly, why has he come? Answer, because we are stuck. 
we're stuck. Um, I don't know why I woke up this morning with a verb to stick in my mind. Maybe it's just I felt a little stiff or something. But I, I, I had in my mind Romans chapter 5 in the Living Bible, which I memorized long ago when I was a teenager. Memorized it then and forgot it by now. But in Romans chapter 5, uh, Kenneth Taylor paraphrases verse 6, when we were utterly helpless with no way of escape. When we were utterly helpless with no way of escape. That sounds like stuck, doesn't it? When we were stuck. Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners who had no use for him. Or as J.B. Phillips gives it to us, and we can see that it was while we were powerless to help ourselves that Christ died for sinful people. Well, we've seen pictures of being stuck most recently in that dreadful situation in China with the mudslide and the collapse of that building, and the graphic pictures of one particular individual who was brought out of there. Uh, how much, how much uh, influence did that fellow have on his salvation? Uh, absolutely none. He may have let out the faintest of whimpers, but he could do nothing to extricate himself from his predicament. He was entirely dependent on those who would come from outside the situation into his situation and extricate him from there. The story of Jesus coming is just that, that he comes from the outside to the inside and pulls out those who are stuck. Stuck! Because we're sinful. Sin is essentially rebellion against God. When we say to God, I don't want you, I don't need you, I don't want to obey your commands, I don't want to listen to your word, it is failing to glorify him, falling short of his glory. In Britain at the moment, until the 3rd of January, hundreds and thousands of people are focused on the World Dart Championships. I don't know if you've seen this. But, um, and it is a sight to behold if you go on TV to find it, or online. You've got maybe 55,000 people watching two fellows throw darts at a dartboard. The fact that they consume vast quantities of alcohol, I think, helps to fuel <laughs> the experience for the people that are present. But uh, there they are, and these men are wonderful at it. Uh, you, you shouldn't, if you've never done this, make a stab at it, because the, the worst thing that you could possibly do is take one of those darts, throw it, and miss the board entirely, just to fall short of the board, just to miss the board, to throw and miss. What the Bible says is that everyone throws and misses when it comes to glorifying, pleasing, loving, and following God. You can miss it by an inch, you can miss the bullseye by a mile, but no one, no one fails to miss. What makes it quite staggering is the fact that our sins are known to God, even when I'm successful in hiding them from you. I can't hide them from God. Even when I flatter myself that I've managed to get away with it for quite a long time now, and I think I'll be able to get away with it all to the end, the fact is I won't. I won't. Remember Moses? He thought he was okay. He, got, he found that fellow. He killed him. And in very short order, somebody said to him, who do you think you are? We saw you the other day when you did what you did. Be sure your sins will find you out. Stuck. You see, sin is our greatest problem. People want to suggest that it's a lack of education, that it's a lack of social welfare, that it's a lack of uh, self-esteem, whatever it is. But what the Bible says is no, that we are alienated from God. We are so quickly in bondage to our own selfish desires and designs, and we live in conflict with one another. You think about this coming to the end of 2015. Go online and read the stories. Just go online and ponder the fact that at this point in the 21st century, our world is full of alienation. Men and women's lives, yours and mine too, are in bondage to all kinds of notions, dreams, schemes, stuff. And we can't live with the people around us. Family gatherings for Christmas become occasions of discord and conflict. Why is this not all fixed by now? Why is this not all sorted? It's almost like we are cosmically stuck. 
Yeah, we are. We need somebody who can come and set the oppressed free, to take the captive and take the handcuffs off, to take the blinders from my eyes and let me see, one, that I'm stuck, and two, that I don't need to stay stuck. You see, the starting point is in that awareness. And it would be one thing if we could just get by, but we can't because sin spoils everything. Every time you tell a lie, it's a bad feeling. Every time you're covetous, you know you shouldn't be. Every time you're selfish and jealous, unkind to your brother, hitting your sister, you go in your bedroom and you know. And what makes it even worse, it not only spoils, but it spreads. It's like a cancer that metastasizes. It's not simply localized and can be removed, but it starts to run through the system, and it separates us then from one another, and it spoils as it spreads, and it separates. That's why the Bible says our great predicament is that we are by nature separated from God. It's the reason that we incur the displeasure of God, the wrath of God, because he's of pewter eyes to behold iniquity. He's like the cancer doctor who hates cancer and will do everything that he possibly can, everything she possibly can to eradicate it. You understand that? Why be a cancer doctor if you don't want to deal with it? God wants to deal with this, and he will go to any length in order to deal with it. Hence, the place of Jesus. Sting is like 112 now, the singer, and— um, <laughs> To quote him is to be a Neanderthal, so I freely acknowledge that. But remember, remember the, the, that song about, I, used to, I believe in science, I believe in this and everything, and then it has that, that middle bar uh, where he says, everyone I know is lonely and God's so far away. And my heart belongs to no one. And so I sometimes say, come, take this space between us and fill it up some way. You take the journey of the Christmas experience. Hence the flatness. Hence the post-Christmas blues. Because once again, people said, this doesn't answer it. There's not a gift I could buy or a gift I could receive. There's not a vacation I could enjoy. There's not a book I could read, a piece of music I could listen to that will actually answer the deepest, dark, separated, chasms of my life? Well, of course not, because the answer is in a person. Why did he come? Because he was sent, because we are stuck, and thirdly and finally, because he's the Savior. As precious as the nativity scenes are, and I actually like nativity scenes. I've been looking at them as I drive around. I'm not sure I want to have one, but I like looking at them. But as nice as they are, they serve only as a pointer, and they point forward to a very different kind of scene, to a dark and ugly scene. They point forward to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the songwriters have done such a good job of making sure that when they deal with that kind of thing, they usually get forward to the reality of Jesus' death in relationship to his life, pointing to the fact that the hour for which Jesus came into the world was actually the hour when he was leaving the world. And Emily Elliot, who was the great niece of Charlotte Elliot, uh, who wrote, amongst other things, Just As I Am Without One Plea, when she was teaching the children's choir in her church in the Midlands of England, she set out to try and make this story of Jesus' life clear, to make sure that they understood that in his life, in his birth, he revealed God. In his itinerant ministry, he preached the story of forgiveness and freedom. In his death, he purchased that freedom. And in his resurrection, he foreshadowed the reality of his return. All of that encompassed in a few verses that begin, Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. You see, that's the message that the believer loves and conveys. 
Now, you would expect a Savior to spend time with sinners, wouldn't you? That's why Jesus says, I, it's not the healthy that need the doctor, it's the sick that need the doctor. I didn't, I didn't come to hang around with these fellows. That really annoyed people. It still annoys people. Jesus in the home of Levi, and the Pharisees saying, why would he go to somebody's house like Levi? Doesn't he know who Levi is? Of course he knows who Levi is. That's why he went to his house. He called Levi to see that he was stuck, and Levi saw that he was stuck, and Jesus unstuck him. And having been unstuck, he took him to his house, and they were all there. And the people that looked on, they were stuck in themselves and in their religion. And when you read through the Gospels, you find that he's there again and again. He's with a religious somebody in John chapter 3 who's stuck in his religion, a man called Nicodemus. And he says to him, you need unstuck. And the only way you'll get unstuck is if you're born again, not as a result of a, human's de a, hu a human decision or of a father's will, but as a result of the divine initiative of God. And when he unsticks you, you will know, and you will sing, and you will praise him. That was his message in 3. He goes on into chapter 4, and he deals in chapter 4 with an irreligious nobody, a woman at a well, who said five marriages isn't got a live-in lover. And what's his story for her? You're stuck. You need living water, the living water that will set you free. She discovers it, goes back into the town, and tells everybody about it. Come see a man who unstuck me. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Jesus makes this perfectly clear. And when John, in his letter, the same John that wrote the gospel, uh, summarizes it, he does so quite masterfully in just a few words. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. Here we go. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. We, we've seen this and we testify to the fact that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. There's a door that is open that you may go in. It's the Calvary's cross. That's where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. Can you imagine anybody in that building there in China saying things like, you know, I'm quite interested in the, uh, in the structure of this building. Quite amazing just how it came down on my head like this. Uh, Sorry? Do you want to bring me out? Um, how are you going to bring me out? Uh, will it be a motorized trolley, or are you going to just carry me? And what color will it be? You say, the person must have lost their mind. Well, they would have lost their mind. The only thing they would do would be to cry. I'm stuck. I'm a dead woman, unless someone comes to get me out. Why did Jesus come? He was sent. He's a man on a mission. He came. His Father covenanted to give him a people for himself. All who come to him will find in him a Savior. All who turn their backs on him will face him in the judgment. He comes not to condemn, but to save. <laughs> 